Well, how about that? Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining Fuel 2021. We have a great day in store for you. Just a big shout out to Cassidy and team. That was some great music. I was bobbing my head for sure. Uh, my name is Miguel Sosa, and it is a privilege to be here with you today. As a member of the Virtue Lab board, I am very, very excited by this year's Fuel and all of the work behind the scenes to get it going. Also thankful for all of our panelists today, but most importantly, each of you for taking time out of your busy schedule to come and join us for a really critical conversation around our climate, our communities, and the technologies that are gonna help us address all of those challenges. So we have a great agenda in store and some good opportunities to network with our community as well. But just quickly a little bit about me. I've been with Virtual Lab for a few years on the board and very, very active in helping support our diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts, as well as really partnering with Virtual Labs, other board members, and our incredible team to look at some exciting technologies that are helping within climate. Uh, during the day, I work at Natural Capital Partners, where as Vice President of the West, I'm looking at offsetting to help address all of those uh, elements of climate that we can't tackle with, uh, with reductions today. And in my spare time, I love traveling. Uh, I'm based here in Portland, Oregon, where it's a lovely sunny day. Originally from Atlanta with heritage in Cuba, as you can see, keep an eye on this chair today. Give me some rotating pillows to give you a little bit of a background on where I came from. But I'm gonna pause there. And I really want to get this started with something that we feel is core to us, acknowledging those that came before us and, and whose uh, ground we're on today. So today, we have a reading of the land acknowledgement provided by the Confederate tribes of the Grand Ronde. And it's gonna be read by my good friend, Ken Vaughn of Virtue Lab. So Ken, let me turn it to you. Thank you, Miguel. We honor this land and its original inhabitants from time immemorial, the Clackamas and Multnomah bands of Chinookan people and the Tualatin band of Kalapuya. The Clackamas have homelands in Northeast and Southeast Portland. The Multnomah have homelands around the confluence of the two great rivers, the Columbia and Willamette. The Tualatin Band of Kalapuya have homelands in the Southwestern and Western portions of the city. They have lived and prospered by maintaining strong cultural ties to the land and through wise management of resources. These tribes and bands were signers of the Willamette Valley Treaty of 1855 which ceded their homelands to the United States in exchange for certain rights and benefits. They were subsequently removed from their homelands to the Grand Ronde Indian Reservation, where they became members of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde. Their descendants live on as tribal members today, carrying on the traditions and cultures of their ancestors, the original people of this land. Thank you very much, Ken. And as uh, you're seeing in our chat window, throughout the day, you're gonna see little posts for additional information. And if you're not joining us from the Portland area today, uh, first and foremost, if in the chat window, if you don't mind typing in what city you're coming from today, it would be great to know, just so I can keep an eye on that. Uh, we do recommend that if you have you know, the interest to please learn about the indigenous territories that we are currently on. And thank you again, Cassidy and team for, for sharing that information uh, in the chat window throughout today. We all know that these events require a lot of work and a lot of support. They also require incredible commitment on behalf of partners and sponsors. And I am, could not be more proud than to thank our title sponsor, Slalom, who is making this event possible. Slalom, for those of you that don't know and you should, is an incredible, consulting firm. They are global and focused on strategy and technology and business transformation. Uh, they are in 40 markets around the world, and I have many good friends who have worked uh, there and, and speak highly of it, and I know why. Uh, they are backed by so much innovation. Uh, they have an incredible culture of collaboration and partnerships with top technology providers, and they've been around. They're in our backyards. Founded in 2001, they're headquartered up in our sister city in Seattle, and they have organically grown, which I think is impressive, to over 10,000 employees. But as my friends say, and as one of my favorite things about any company, 
Slalom has been named one of Fortune 100's best companies to work for six years running. I think that says a lot and just congratulations to Slalom on being recognized by your employees as the best place to work. Uh, please learn more about Slalom. And again, many, many thanks for supporting our work and our initiatives and also having a culture that embraces the need for exploration and innovation in this climate tech journey. Additionally, I want to talk a little bit about the event platform. So for those of you joining through the event hub, and this might be your first time using that platform, you can get to know your fellow attendees by posting a hello in the social feed tab. And that can be found on the left-hand side, left, uh, whichever way is left, uh, on the left-hand side where you can click the menu icon. You can also schedule meetings with other attendees right here by visiting someone's profile and booking a meeting with them. Uh, please feel free to schedule one with me and, and I will get back to you. I get to MC today, but I'm looking forward to and have already received uh, some really great uh, requests to catch up. So looking forward to meeting with all of you. And also don't forget that after each session today, we're gonna have an opportunity to network by joining the Zoom link after each session found in your agenda. So make sure that uh, you keep an eye on that and stick around after the sessions for some great networking. Really excited to learn more about each of you today and hope that you find meaningful connections that uh, you can carry on uh, professionally and, and socially in these times. Additionally, I wanted to, uh, to share a little bit about Virtue Lab's roles, right? So we are here as a nonprofit to help look at clean tech and how do we help move this agenda forward, the impacts that it has on society and how do we involve our communities in doing so. And we can't do so without the support again of great organizations like Slalom and also the support of you. So we do have a goal of raising $5,000 by the end of this summit. These funds go to keep our entrepreneur support accessible and helping ensure that our entrepreneurs have every chance they can to take their incredible concepts and see them into fruition. We're gonna be posting a link here in the chat, thank you again, for you to help us through that. And we really appreciate if you would consider doing so. Every dollar helps. And these dollars, again, go to help our entre entrepreneurs to create those businesses and jobs in our communities. They help us reduce greenhouse gas emissions by implementing these incredible technologies. So we appreciate you thinking about that. But we always know that folks also like little incentives, and I'm one of those. So new and exciting this year, and made possible by our special sponsor, CORE, Virtue Lab is selling a limited edition water bottle just for the month of September. These are so limited edition that I asked one uh, for one, and as you can see, uh, I did not get one. So I need to go on and, and reserve one. Uh, their goal is to sell 50 of these water bottles. I highly recommend that if you enjoy water bottles and, and the bling that comes with it, that you get on there and, and uh, grab one. And uh, if you're a fan of, of not using a different plastic bottle every day, this is a good way to do it. So join us over in the uh, sustainability shop. Again, that's in the menu toward the bottom where you can find these and other sustainable items uh, available to you as a fuel attendee at a special discount. We hope that you go over, grab one and uh, save one for me if you can. With that being said, I'm very delighted to introduce my dear friend and the executive director of Virtual Lab, David Kinney, who's going to help open our session with a few opening words and then introduce our first session. David, to you, thank you so much. Thank you, Miguel. And uh, thank you everyone who's participating today. We're really thrilled to have you here. This is our 13th annual summit that Virtual Lab has hosted. And uh, we really celebrate the opportunity every September that we've had to bring together our community of innovators, entrepreneurs, investors, economic development professionals, corporate partners, students, researchers, and others that are committed to working at the intersection of innovative climate solutions and a just thriving economy. We use a holistic approach to supporting innovators and entrepreneurs at Virtual Lab, where we provide a variety of services and also provide patient risk tolerant capital investment. I'm really excited to share that we announced this week the first three investments from our Climate Impact Fund, which invests 
typically before regular conventional investors are willing to. And we're able to provide some of the earliest support financially to innovative climate solution uh, technology development startups. Our first three investments have gone to Blue Dot Photonics, which is making solar panels more efficient, OpConnect, which is bringing EV, EV charging to more and more places, and Harvest Thermal, which is focused on all electric space and water heating technologies that are much more efficient. Those are the first three of many investments we'll be making from this Climate Impact Fund, which is open uh, for applications. So the innovators here are encouraged to check that out on our website, as well as the other support programs that we provide to help entrepreneurs make it to market. I'm really excited to have you here today, and I'm excited to introduce the moderator of our next panel, and also to join her as one of the panelists. Sherelle Dorsey is the founder and CEO of The Plug, which is a digital news and insights platform covering the Black innovation economy. Her work has been featured in Vice, The Washington Post, Seattle Times, The Information, and more. Sherelle has been a contributing writer for notable publications like Columbia Journalism Review, Fast Company, Black Enterprise, and others. In 2018, she was named an inspiring woman in tech by CNET. Prior to launching the plug, Sherelle served as a marketing manager for companies like Uber and Google Fiber. She holds a master's degree in data journalism from Columbia University. She's bringing her extensive knowledge to us today of the innovation economy and her passion for equity in tech. And she's gonna be leading this conversation. So I'd like to hand it off to Sherelle. Thank you so much for the warm introduction, David. It is such a privilege and such an honor to join everyone here today um, for, the, for the, full, the Fuel Summit, excuse me. Um, I am excited for this conversation. Um, again, my name is Sherelle Dorsey, founder of The Plug, and we are really the go-to business intelligence for inclusive thinkers and business leaders as we consider that the future has to be one in which everyone is involved. I'm excited to have this conversation today, specifically on clean tech as well as economic development. Um, and join, joining me here this afternoon is Jetta Wong, um, also, excuse me, from ITIF and JLW Advising. We have Dan Berglin from SSTI, and you already know David Kenny here from Virtue Lab. I'm going to give you all an opportunity to quickly introduce yourselves. Jetta, can we start with you? Just a brief, brief um, about your background. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Rel. It's wonderful to be with everyone today. Very exciting to be at this conference. Um, as you said, my name is Jetta Wong, and I'm a consultant that works with entrepreneurs, communities, incubators, national labs, and universities on the commercialization of clean energy technologies. And what I have found in my career is that it's great to find a good market and a customer for your new technology, and that happens often in communities. Um, and so some of my work at ITIF, which is the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation, focuses on bringing those lessons learned from your communities, from your experiences into Washington, DC, so we can make sure that we have good federal policies that are supporting all of you. And I look forward to this panel discussion. Thank you so much, Jetta. Um, Dan, let's kick it over to you. Please introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit more about your background. Sure. Uh, I'm Dan Berglund, the president and CEO of SSTI. Um, SSTI is a national nonprofit organization. We've been in existence for 25 years and we're focused on uh, best practices, lessons learned for all of the organizations around the country like Virtue Lab that are trying to create a better future through science, technology, innovation, and entrepreneurship. Thank you, Dan. Um, David, I think most of the room already knows you, but please feel free again to reiterate for those who are just now joining us um, a bit more about your role um, at Virtue Lab. Sure, thank you. Um, so I'm the executive director at Virtue Lab, which uh, gives me a chance to really uh, look at both our past and our future and try to set the direction for the organization. We have our roots in economic development. 
um, but have always focused on helping innovators with technologies that are solving the climate crisis or other environmental challenges. And so, um, you know, a big part of what we do, I think, is really to prove that we can uh, we can tackle environmental problems and see them as an economic opportunity and an opportunity for economic growth and not uh, a barrier. And uh, and we've also in the last few years, really been embracing the, the challenge that all organizations face, I believe, to, uh, to try to create a more just society, a more just economy, and a more just organization that, we, that we're part of. Thank you so much, David. And thank you to everyone who is joining in um, this this af well, it's afternoon, because I'm on the East Coast, but um, perhaps it is morning for you. Thank you so much for joining in here. Um, I see there are quite a few of you all, some names I see that are, are pretty familiar, um, but I'm excited for this discussion, primarily because we know that this year, this last year, has been pretty intense. Um, the last maybe almost two years has been pretty intense, and we are really, really um, grappling with this question of what is the future of work? What is the future of climate as we're facing these very real and challenging times around climate? Um, as I mentioned before, I live here in Miami. Um, of course, um, Hurricane Ida just in the last few weeks has really, really um, hit a lot of our southern, our southern states. It's also hit some of our northeastern states. And this talk of climate over the last 12 to 18 months has exponentially changed the conversation of how we think about climate, how we think about climate tech, the attention put on the industry, the resources going into the industry and the entrepreneurs and the, the builders and the folks such as yourself who are helping to advise on the acceleration of what we need in terms of tools to help protect ourselves. But there's a really strong economic development play here in how innovation prior to um, has changed drastically. Um, I'd love for, for anyone here on the panel um, to really hop in here and to help us understand what role has innovation played um, in this economic development conversation as we address climate and sort of how has it changed today? Looks like David, you unmuted yourself first. So I'm gonna go ahead and call on you. All right. Um, so I, I, would, I would say innovation is, is central. The, um, the climate crisis requires a very broad a uh, set of solutions to, to be successful. Project Drawdown has identified a whole bunch of solutions, um, none of which singly can solve the climate crisis, but collectively can. And some of those solutions range from education to reforestation to other natural resources-based uh, solutions. But many of them are based on technology and many of them require additional innovation in order to be cost-effective, efficient um, or to exist even at all. And so uh, innovation is really central to, uh, to bringing a complete holistic solution to the crisis that we're in. And I also uh, uh, you know, recognize that innovation means new technologies and new products, and that creates a huge opportunity to generate wealth um, and to create jobs. And um, so there's, there's to me a, a, a huge upside opportunity from, from an economic perspective. Absolutely. And I mean, we, we think of, of climate change, we think of all of these things as very, of course, very near and present challenges, and maybe even a little bit of doom and gloom on that end. But there's sort of this bright side of the possibilities and the innovation that happens and emerges as people come together with ideas. Dan, I know that you had wanted to, to um, jump in here. So I'll, I'll, let, I'll go ahead and give you the floor on this one as well. Yeah, I, I think um, innovation is fundamental to economic growth um, and particularly when it comes to climate change crisis. Um, yeah, there is a long history of states and regions um, investing in technology to improve their economy. This dates back really to the late 1970s, early 80s, um, with the recession at that time and the way it impacted uh, the Rust Belt states. 
what we've seen over time is different states focusing on different technology areas. So a lot of states interested in advanced manufacturing, a lot of states interested in biotechnology. Then for a little while, it was nanotechnology. Um, climate tech, uh, it, the interest in climate tech is starting to catch up um, and it is long overdue. You know, I'd love to add in there that I think the innovation side of climate tech has also become something that is really critical because of what David already said is that I think people are starting to realize that um, we can't meet our climate targets without innovation. And so the conversations that people are having now around meeting those targets where they used to, you know, in, in Washington, D.C. at least, there used to be certain technologies and sort of innovations that were off limits. People, when I first started working on clean energy 20 years ago, were, were not interested in hydrogen. We're not interested in CCS. And right now people are saying, okay, we know that there are some complications with this, but we also know we need these technologies. And they're looking to innovation to make those technologies more sustainable. And we need to be pushing our scientists, our engineers, and our entrepreneurs in that direction because we need to meet those targets. And we can't do it without some of these technologies. So I, I think it's a critical role that it's going to play in, um, in our climate crisis. Thank you, Jetta. And, and just to follow up on that point as well, um, Perhaps you, Jetta, or anyone else here on the panel, David or Dan, um, do you have any examples of successful partnerships you've really seen um, either in the past or recently that is making this opportunity for tech development easier or faster, um, even just from a, a development standpoint overall? Sure, I'm happy to jump in. I know that Dan probably has a bunch of examples, but um, you know, I do a ton of work with the Department of Energy's national laboratories. And there are 17 of them across the country. And the one example that I like to point to is with Oak Ridge National Laboratory in Tennessee. They are a two and a half billion dollar annual budget um, organization that does everything from classified science to testing of windows for energy efficiency. And over the last several years, they've really done a lot to engage in advanced energy, uh, in an advanced energy economy, including opening up several of its laboratories to manufacturers, as Dan was talking about. And this has really increased um, economic growth in their region, drawing in new companies that are focused on real um, interesting and new carbon manufacturing technologies growing the auto manufacturing industry, not just in Tennessee, but in the whole region. And this is really growing off of the, the investment dollars that the federal government has put into this laboratory around innovation. Um, I probably could go on, but Danny, I'm sure you have lots of historic examples. Yeah, I would just add a couple. It seems to me that um, most of these and I'm not sure, by the way, to the tech, if I'm doing anything wrong or if you guys are able to see me because, okay, good. All right. I can see Dan. <laughs> because I'm just getting reaction shots of everybody else. So anyway, um, it seems to me a lot of the activity on the state level in terms of climate tech and um, originated in the Northeast part of the country. So the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, NYSERDA, Connecticut, Massachusetts, um, have all taken surcharges uh, from their utility bills to invest in alternative energy um, R&D and supporting um, startup companies. Um, as well. So um, what is the real opportunity here as you and Jetta have um, indicated is the large climate polls that the federal government is interested in and is now on the verge of putting billions of dollars in as well. That, right, cross our fingers, don't wanna jinx it. 
Um, that is going to make a huge difference in uh, really moving this field and the individual efforts around the country. Thank you. Thank you for helping us to contextualize that, especially from the dollar amount in terms of the investments that are going in. Is That's always been one of the key topics of conversations, even when I started off early on in my reporting on climate technologies, green technology, sustainability, there was always such a, dis a disparity in terms of the kind of funding that those specific environments received in comparison to other kinds of technology. So it sounds like to Jetta, your, your point earlier, there appears to be some track of catching up, um, particularly based on necessity. And David, I wanted to, to actually um, turn this over to you from the sort of private sector investment standpoint to also understand as an investor in the Pacific Northwest, how you see those dollars being allocated across this particular industry, but then also as you're speaking to your colleagues in other markets, um, if the conversation is starting to turn more so towards the investment into climate technologies. Yeah, well, what I can say is that the, uh, the investment picture is dramatically different today than it was a year ago or two years ago. Um, there's massive amounts of venture capital moving into climate tech. Um, the, 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 there's still a gap, however, um, between sort of traditional research and development funding that often comes from government uh, and where that venture capital is, is able to be deployed. The, those dollars come from investors who have an expectation of a certain return within a certain time frame, and it sort of necessitates that uh, those investment dollars go to companies that have already met some key technology development milestones, possibly customer engagement milestones, maybe revenue. And, um, and so the good news is that if companies can cross the divide and get to the point where they've met those milestones, there's a lot of money available for them. And that is very different than, than was the case uh, in, in the past decade. Um, so that's really promising. The, the problem is, is that to get to that point requires capital that, that doesn't come from conventional sources. Um, and so what happens is a, a lot of a lot of ideas get left on the shelf and the ones that make it often come from people that have had prior success already. So they have already uh, sort of proven themselves and are able to attract uh, more risk tolerant capital because they, they, they're a proven entrepreneur or they've got family money or they're connected to an elite institution. Um, and that leaves a lot of people behind. Um, and so, you know, one of the, the challenge that we've taken on at Virtual Lab with our investment fund is we're, really, we're intentionally investing. We're using uh, investments from philanthropic sources to invest at an earlier stage. And you know, coming back to the question about partnerships, you know, partnerships are critical because um, there needs to be handoffs. Um, and and you know, we, we partner closely with universities and national labs to try to identify uh, resources, both technologies coming out of those places, but also recognizing that they're valuable uh, support for some of these technologies who can be expert advisors. Um, and similarly, we look on the other side, the other end of the spectrum in that middle gap where um, we're, we're identifying some of those downstream investors that may be willing to work. And so, um, so anyway, that's, that, that's where I see the, both the partnership piece playing and also the private sector investment. Can I jump in just a second? David's raised a point that I think is really important um, which is just the stage of where the venture capital industry is right now. The trend over the last decade, the last decade and a half, is venture capitalists are moving further and further downstream and to larger deals as well. And we're seeing that as well with angel investors as well, who historically um, have been interested in seed investing. They're tending to move uh, further downstream and larger as well. And so for regions like Oregon and the Pacific Northwest that have a virtue lab, um, that's great that uh, it's helping to fill part of that market gap that exists. But in the rest of the country, where the virtue labs don't exist, that's a real challenge, not just for this industry, but 
also for involving all peoples uh, in this um, technology industry as well. You know, just, oh, yeah, please, please, please go ahead and jump in there, Jenna. Well, I would just say, and you know, just building off of that is what you know. I think we're going to start seeing with these big dollars that, um, Sherelle, you were just mentioning um, coming from the federal government is that they have a concerted effort to make sure that we are dispersing those dollars across the country, not just on the coast and supporting organization, organizations like Virtue Lab that are working with entrepreneurs in their communities to solve community problems. So there's a lot of good opportunity. Um, so keep an eye out and, and watch what's going on in Washington, DC, um, because they, they want to support organizations like Virtue Lab and, and many others that are across the country working in the space. That's such a great um, statement, Jetta and, and Dan as well. When we do look at the opportunity, as, um, as David mentioned earlier, if we can get more people tackling this issue, we get more ideas on the table, we get more companies created, more solutions created. But of course, that infrastructure really starts with spreading the wealth, right? Both geographically and across communities, and particularly communities that are sometimes deemed more vulnerable. Um, again, even as we see the recovery happening with Ida, same as I was actually in undergrad in college in 2005 when Hurricane Katrina hit, and we're still even seeing, you know, families and communities still, we're just trying to recover from that um, instance of, of, of climate um, impact. And so when we talk about this, this conversation, this sort of equity conversation that's also tied deeply to economic development, um, I'd, I'd love to hear um, from either of you um, sort of what are some of the opportunities that exist when we look at addressing even greater challenges outside of just climate, right? Being able to invest in this space means we can address things like income inequality, if we're creating jobs in certain markets. Um, we can touch neighborhoods, again, as it was mentioned here just a few minutes ago, um, around giving others access, um, be that from certain kinds of communities, from racially diverse communities, um, or even just not along the coast, that kind of heartland of America. Um, how does this how does this happen? What do we what do we need to be mindful of in this industry for this to be an opportunity for deep equity in a space that has traditionally just not been an equitable environment? So maybe I can start and then Jetta, if you want to jump in and clean up the mess that I leave behind. We'll uh, be fine, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, so I would say part of the issue is, again, if you go back and look historically at um, why most of these state-sponsored programs were created, it was because there was a severe economic recession. And so the motivation for these organizations was job creation. You know, we need more jobs. Um, and that was great, and it made sense for the time, but that's not really the challenge right now. The challenge now is about income inequality and addressing the societal issues, the, the big societal issues um, that we face. So what's encouraging to me is seeing organizations around the country um, that have a long track record of doing good work, shifting um, and starting to change their focus to addressing these issues. So a couple examples, Innovation Works in Pittsburgh, uh, Jumpstart in Cleveland, um, Rev1 Ventures in Columbus, all of them, a large percentage of their investment portfolio now is going to um, companies that are owned by women or by people of color. Um, and part of the lesson that they've learned is that they have to partner with other organizations. They can't go in and do this on their own. And I think for a lot of organizations, that's been really humbling because they're used to being uh, the lead partner. And um, here it may be that they need to 
um, play more of a supporting role and provide their expertise, but allow other organizations to lead. So I think there are a lot of lessons learned there. I mean, this is um, this is just a huge issue. I mean, it is from um, pre-K uh, through undergrad in terms of getting people involved in STEM and giving them the opportunities, allowing them to have the opportunity to go to college, come out of college relatively debt-free. Um, we know there's a strong connection between student loan debt and the decline in entrepreneurship that we've seen. Um, so anyway, I, I can go on and on, but let me stop there and uh, let Jetta jump in. Well, there's just so much to follow up on there, but I do have to, I want to really agree that partnership and collaboration is really key to so many things that we are facing today. I, I look at partnership and collaboration, especially when we're talking about um, the, the commercialization of some of these new technologies is key because it, it's not just about one entrepreneur that has this idea. It's about a whole community of people that want to bring that idea to fruition where it's actually solving a problem in the market. It's a customer, it's a community, it's the supply chain, it's the private sector investor, it's the incubator that's supporting it. And, and it is hard for everyone to work together. Um, and that's why there is that valley or that bridge that needs to be you know, walked across but you can only do that with partners in my mind. And I, so I wanna first reiterate that, Dan, absolutely. Um, but I, I also wanna say, you know, I think that what we've seen over the last year um, with the, the climate crisis being right in front of us, on top of us with the fires, with the floods, with the heat waves, at the same time that we as a country are Re reckoning with racial injustice that has been going on for, for the history of our country and an economic downturn, right? Where we need to be thinking about jobs. Those three things have come together in a way that I think is very different than in the past, where we are trying to purposefully address them together, all of it. And, uh, you know, going back to some of the things that we were talking about, related to the potential amount of money that is going to come from the federal government, the president, President, has Biden, president Biden has been very clear that he wants to make sure that the benefits of our investments are going to communities across this country. I think people have heard of the Justice 40 initiative, um, which he started the first week that he was in the White House through an executive order, which is focused on making sure that 40% of the benefits of our climate and clean energy and environmental investments are going to those communities across the country. Um, he's followed through with a White House Council on Environmental Justice. They have released a report earlier this year in May, kind of highlighting many things and, and actually gets at one of the things that you were talking about, Sherelle, about these different communities across country. How do we know who they are? What do they need? Um, the report talks about a climate justice screening tool, which will help federal agencies identify the needs and, and where these communities are. And then they just recently in July put out further guidance. I know if any of you out there are looking to get federal dollars in the next coming years, you should be looking at this guidance because it articulates what the federal government will be doing in, in trying to encourage the agencies to address these issues together. Um, so, you know, this is a really big deal because there's going to be a ton of money coming to the states, into the regions, into private sector companies and entrepreneurs. And the point is to address these issues together with that money. And with that, David, I'd love for you to um, further expand on your, your, your point earlier around the connectivity with philanthropy and specifically, you know, organizations or foundations or family offices that are just as invested in the technology innovation to address climate 
are they also are they also tasked with or have missions around the racial equity or geographic equity in this space as well? It, it, and I think you brought up this this really strong point, Jetta. We can't really be divorced across this line in addressing any issue um, in in this country, but particularly related to infrastructure and climate. But as philanthropic dollars, um, particularly last year, um, you know, following the murder of George Floyd, there were all of these really strong and bold commitments, lots of money, lots of friends and colleagues whose foundations saw more money than they ever saw donated to their organizations. I'm curious how, from a private sector investor standpoint and the relationships you're building from the philanthropic standpoint, how that's sort of shaping up around their equity play as they're making these investments, if at all. Yeah, I, I, uh, we're definitely seeing more foundations um, highlighting uh, racial justice as a priority. Um, I think, you know, as, as with corporations, as with individuals, you're gonna see a spectrum of responses, um, some of which are really deep um, where I, I see uh, foundations really putting in the work to think about the composition of their own trustees and their staff and, uh, and wanting to center racial justice in their grant making and, um, you know, and, and, re and recognizing the intersectionality of, of race and the environment or race and uh, you know, other human services and human needs. And, uh, and things like that. So I, I, I definitely see some that are doing that. And I think you know, you'll also see some who know that they need to do something and are you know, setting aside dollars specifically for racial justice initiatives, which is also you know, desperately needed, um, but maybe aren't quite as connected to their other programs. They you know, still sort of maintain that as a silo from, you know, we do grant making in this area, grant making in this area, and now we're also doing grant making uh, to address racial justice. Um, so you see the spectrum, but absolutely um, a lot more philanthropy is focused in, uh, in, in the issues of racial justice. And, um, uh, and I think, you know, as it relates to climate, you know, climate has gotten a tiny, tiny fraction of philanthropy historically, um, you know, like less than 2%. And, uh, and to the extent that there was money going uh, into climate, it was really focused on either conservation um, like land protection and uh, sort of wildlife protection uh, or advocacy, you know, specifically trying to change policy, which is both of, both of which are critical, but very little, if any, uh, for in, in, in most cases, philanthropy has gone into addressing the, the gap that we have around innovation. And that's, that's starting to change now too. And we definitely are seeing uh, you know, a small number of foundations that recognize that uh, private sector innovation is critical um, and that there's a gap and that it's okay for philanthropy to actually support the development of businesses as part of the solution, which is, you know, kind of runs counter to um, the way a lot of people think about philanthropy. They shouldn't be helping um, businesses, but, but I think um, the innovation component of that is resonating and the need for that to be a part of the overall portfolio of climate uh, investments that philanthropy is making. Thank you, David. I, I, Do you want to jump in there? Yeah, no, um, I just want to really build on that because David is absolutely right as it relates to philanthropy and, and the climate funding that we've seen. I think one of the reasons why we're starting to see more funding in the, the space around these entrepreneurs that have these new technologies is one that, again, they're recognizing um, the fact that in the climate space, we need new technology, we need innovation if we're going to meet, meet our climate goals. Uh, but I also think that we've had some really good examples of communities and incubators that are focused on our environmental um, problems and our climate um, issues, looking at technology as a solution. I think what Virtue Lab has been doing is fantastic. We also have seen stuff from the Los Angeles Clean Tech Incubator, where they, they've been working in their community for years to address their climate issues, but through a, a racial lens, like a racial justice lens. They, they've been talking to their communities, understanding the workforce development problems, and trying to integrate that throughout their programs. And I honestly think that that has helped inform philanthropic groups about the opportunity 
to fund these great organizations across the country that are solving community problems in in ways that are different and new um, using technology. And I think that there are examples across the country, whether or not it's Clean Energy Trust or Elemental Accelerator working with their tribal communities there. And I think we have wonderful examples of the philanthropic world um, you know, meeting us at the table and, and talking to, to communities around the country. What's been interesting about this conversation, um, as well as what you highlighted, Jetta, um, part of President Biden's plan around investment in this space as well, is the opportunity for greater transparency. I think there's always great um, mandates, right? There's there's lots of mandates. I think once it trickles down to entrepreneurs, entrepreneur support ecosystems, entrepreneurs themselves, um, sometimes on the ground, the experience with some of these entities or e even from a venture capital standpoint can look very different than what that initial press release says, right? And so the need for transparency around how resources are being allocated um, and eventually what that will look like across the board five years from now when we take a look back, 10 years from now when we take a look back, how do we actually ensure that the, the equity conversation that we're having, it really does end up playing out in all of these initiatives because sometimes you have to retroactively look and say, oops, we made a mistake or oops, we forgot this group or oops, we forgot to talk to these individuals or these certain, these communities. Um, what, are, what are some of the frameworks you all are seeing, um, you know, be it on the, on the federal level with, you know, private clients or even in, in the philanthropic space where there's some level of data transparency that's happening maybe in real time or regularly that helps us to feel confident about, you know, not just the great opportunity for the investment taking place, it's an exciting time, but also as we, as we make these promises to the public around representation, that that actually does happen. Yeah, it has to be in the measurement system of um, whoever is providing the funding. So if it's at the federal level, the federal agencies, the federal programs have to build it into the measurement system um, to begin with, so that uh, the groups that are receiving the money are held accountable. Um, and uh, that um, it's not just lip service that's provided, but that there's a long-term commitment. Um, and that can be done. I mean, there are good examples outside the climate tech uh, field the Manufacturing Extension Partnership, which is part of the Department of Commerce, um, they have a very rigorous uh, customer evaluation and economic impact. And the way the Manufacturing Extension Partnership Centers operate is very focused on what the Department of Commerce tells them they're going to be measured on. So, you know, when I used to work for the state of Ohio, the saying among the states was, uh, it's the golden rule. You know, those that have the gold rule. Um, so it's really up to the funders to make sure that this is going to be a longstanding commitment. So this is one of the reasons why I've been very interested in engaging more with communities and cities in this economic development conversation because you know most of my work has been through the Department of Energy looking at it through what DOE measures it measures carbon emissions it measures BTUs it measures you know it's thinking about energy efficiency but when we start to have conversations with other agencies, with other communities, with other parts of the innovation world, we can learn from them. And, and I think that there's a lot that we could learn from uh, economic development offices, from EDA, from housing and urban development, because these are issues that they have been dealing with forever, right? We, that's not something that we've been thinking about from a climate perspective. And so, you know, one of the really great things around this Justice 40 initiative is that it's an all a government initiative. It's not just focused at EPA or the Department of Energy focused around climate change. 
trying to bring the whole government together and say, what can we learn from each other? How can we integrate this through the federal programs? And one of the first things it said it's going to do is figure out how to do reporting and ca calculate those benefits. So we don't really have a good sense of what the benefits have been of our federal funding thus far in this space, because we don't really measure it. But now we're going to actually start to measure and hopefully get some best practices from other parts of the country, hopefully communities that have been doing it better than the federal government so we can rapidly get up to speed. It's such a, it sounds like such a promising time. David, did you want to comment on that? I, I didn't want to skip over you here. No, that's no, okay. I, I, I just, I agree with that, okay. uh, with both, with both their points, especially around measurement. It's really critical to set specific targets so that you can assess whether you're achieving your goals or not. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that transparency is, is important for us, you know, as a, as a journalist. And when I think about our audience and as we're distilling insights and information to our core audience, a lot of times, you know, when, when we think that government is not doing anything, um, there's all of these programs and initiatives that are happening sort of behind the scenes or that are happening in real time that we're just not aware of. And a lot of times that disconnection doesn't give us the opportunity to see, well, okay, here, here are pots of resources, here are ways in which we can better engage um, as well, that there is activity happening. And now we just have to find the best way and route in, in which to tap in, um, especially with the organizations that are being onboarded to also receive some of the benefits of you know, technical assistance as well as dollars as well to help those those initiatives grow. Um, before we hop into um, to the next question, I did just want to let everyone um, here know you can use the Q and A box at the bottom of the screen to type a question to any of our panelists here. We have um, one Q and A. Um, question posted that we'll answer um, as we start to close out the panel discussion, but feel free to add your question right here at the bottom right of your screen if you'd like to ask a question to our panelists. Um, so what, what I love about this discussion um, with you all and, and really getting a sense of your expertise in this space is beyond the economic development conversation, there really is some of the dire needs of innovation for future protection, future evolution, if we want to call it that, um, and this idea around security and competitiveness. And I'd love for either of you to sort of hop in there and talk about the importance um, of us as a nation to be working on these issues, both from the climate, economic development frame, as well as the inclusion frame, as it relates to our future sort of survival in, in marketplaces um, and, and as well as the protection of our, of our country. Jetta, you want to start this time? And Sure, I, I would be happy to. Well, I think it's all linked. I think that we uh, are a global economy now. When, when the United States was the powerhouse in science and technology, and in many ways we still are, um, we weren't competing with other countries. We had the best manufacturing. We had um, you know, the best scientists. We're in a different world now. We had a report came out last year um, that said of 35 um, critical materials, 14 of them are 100% imported from other countries. 14 of them, these are technologies, these are, these are critical materials that we are going to need for batteries, electric vehicles, wind turbines. That is a national security and competitiveness issue. And we have innovations that can start to address this and we are putting money into these areas, but it takes a long time. You know, the thing that I worry about the most is not that we're not gonna have these innovations, but that we're not gonna have them in time to address this climate crisis. And, you know, I think about this, if we just stay with this critical materials piece, we have some of these materials here in the United States. Um, and we have, for example, lithium. We have also state and local federal permitting requirements that may slow this process down. And that's appropriate in a lot of instances. Um, for example, we need to be talking to our tribal communities. We need to be talking to all communities where these new potential lithium deposits are to develop them. We also need to be understanding that 
this is going to take time and we need to make sure that we're addressing that in this larger complex, this larger picture of a global economic system. So I think that th there are tons of things that we could talk about here, but I'm just going to leave it at that because I know Dan has some other examples. Well, I think I, I, I not surprisingly, I agree with everything <laughs> that I have to say. Um, but I think maybe the one other perspective that I would add to this is that um, I think one of the things that the pandemic did and then uh, the murder of George Floyd did um, at the same time was really expose the fundamental problems that um, exist in the country. And so, you know, there were folks before the pandemic that was saying, this is the best economy that the country has ever had. And I looked at the economy and I said, if you want to measure it by the unemployment rate, you can make that argument, but it's a much bigger picture than that. The economic divide that we have um, in this country the competitiveness problems that we have internationally. Um, so the one good thing about the pandemic and the discussion of racial justice is it does give us the opportunity to make the kind of investments that we should have been making for decades. And um, like Jetta, you know, my concern is, is whether we're going to, I don't think it's too late, but we are really pushing it in terms of how late we have waited in order to make the kind of investments that we need to make, both from a climate perspective, but from a broader economic competitiveness and a human infrastructure perspective. Absolutely. You know, maybe, could I add on that human infrastructure perspective? I think the other thing that really is actually exciting about this moment is that we also are starting to understand that to be competitive, we need to have these more um, direct, a more directed approach in developing new industries in our country and supporting those new industries in our country. At the same time, we're having direct conversations with communities that have not necessarily benefited from a lot of the new technology development that's happened over decades. If we can bring those two things together, where we're actually helping communities, listening to them, pulling them into the dialogue and ensuring that we are um, listening to them and saying, could this technology be what you need? And can we then build around it in your community to create the supply chains, to create the manufacturing facilities and the good jobs that go along with it in partnership, I think is a really exciting opportunity. And I think that that's how we can all partner together to support you know, US competitiveness in building these new clean energy you know, technologies. Absolutely. Um, Awesome. All right, David, I, I just wanted to make sure you didn't want to hop in here before we moved on. Well, only one thing, which is to add that um, I really feel like climate solutions, if we treat them as, you know, like their own category separate from uh, infrastructure investments or separate from economic recovery funds, we will have missed a massive opportunity. Um, if every infrastructure investment was a climate investment and if every economic development investment was also considering equity issues and considering climate. Uh, I, I truly believe we could start to make some of the shifts that, that, uh, that Dan and Jetta were just talking about. Very great point, David. I wanna go ahead and transition us here to Q&A. We have two questions here um, that we'll answer here live. Um, so this question goes, comes from Joe Brickman. Joe asks, thanks for bringing up the larger value chain required, Jetta. There's such a huge opportunity for the broader clean tech sector of manufacturing, installation, commissioning, maintenance, a lot of the points you were just making. 
What are the key pieces of enabling and supporting ecosystem infrastructure required for clean tech clusters to collaborate across the value chain? Well, I'm a big fan of incubators. <laughs> I, I think I, I, I've you know, been watching what David's been doing for, for years and what several other incubators across the country do. And what I see is an organization that is the connective tissue, bringing all of those different partners together to ensure that our entrepreneurs are supported and receiving the, the investment, the expertise, the, the technical assistance um, that they need at the right time, because we don't have any time to waste. And so I think that, that, that incubators and accelerators and economic development organizations that are, that are thinking about their entrepreneurs um, and playing that connective tissue in their communities are, are, are a key part in the innovation cycle and will really move us forward much faster. But I think everyone on this call knows that I already think that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll add to say that, um, you, you know, that our focus at Virtual Lab historically has been really focused on sort of the deepest tech solutions. Um, many of the innovators we work with uh, have PhDs or they come from engineering backgrounds. And we've been really trying to think about how to ensure a diverse pipeline of racial diversity, gender diversity uh, in the pipeline of innovators. But to a certain extent, if the requirement is that you have a PhD or an engineering background, um, we're, we're limited in our pipeline to a certain extent by you know, systems before that. The, the opportunities that, you know, I just I made the comment about looking for these opportunities to intersect economic development, infrastructure, and climate, um, that's going to create a whole supply chain of of solutions and needs, um, some of which are those deep tech uh, innovations, some of which are, you know, as, as Joe's question, uh, you know, alluded to maintenance uh, of those things or the installation or the manufacturing of those things. There's a whole supply chain of solutions, both before and after the, the actual technology innovation piece. And, you know, I think that's one of the places where, you know, as we think about wealth generation, job creation. You know, a lot of times we focus on job creation in communities, but if, if there's an opportunity to create more entrepreneurs uh, from the communities where these technologies are being deployed, um, who don't need to have PhDs, but you know, could, could be a, you know, a solar installer or could maintain EV charging stations, um, that's a huge opportunity and you know, business entrepreneurship is a place where wealth can be created and then can pass along through generations. So I think that's, that's a big opportunity that, that, we're, that we're seeing and something that we're exploring at Virtue Lab. And our approach to that is going back to earlier in this conversation, partnership. And that's where there are organizations that are already working in communities of color and in low-income communities where we don't have uh, an established presence. Um, but we do have things that we believe we can offer as, as it relates to supporting entrepreneurs. And if we can partner with those organizations, we think there's a real opportunity to create more innovators, um, not necessarily deep tech, but, but much broader um, type of activities. Absolutely. As you were speaking, David, it just made me think um, of Charger Help, um, the company out of Compton started by two Black women um, who previously worked in workforce development and were creating certifications for uh, folks in the community to earn about 30 to 50 bucks an hour uh, providing support services for electrical vehicle charging stations um, and using that technology and those training and certifications across across the nation um, and getting folks who typically would not you know be eligible to be a part of the tech economy um, to now have a place in it by, by serving a very critical need for businesses when charging stations malfunction and it's been remarkable to see that they're able to really massively upskill or skill folks um, into a high paid green job. Um, that again does not require for your degree, but puts people sort of immediately to work um, following their their training. So um, that just really uh, came to mind as, as you were as you were sharing. Um, one of the the next questions here um, is specifically for for you, David, um, and it asks uh, from Matt Simonson. My apologies if I butcher your last name, Simonson. Has Virtue Lab 
ever considered establishing an opportunity zone fund specifically for qualified opportunity zone businesses? Um, and Matt says that there are several zones in Portland. Yeah. Um, before I answer that question, I'll, I, I want to give give credit to uh, you mentioned Charger Help that that story actually informed and inspired our thinking. Uh, that I couldn't think of their name, or I would have mentioned them specifically. But but that that story from from Los Angeles really informed um, our thinking. It's a great example, um, and, uh, and so I just wanted to, to, to shout out to the, to that. Um, uh, as far as the opportunity zones. Uh, we, I would say yes, we've considered it, we've looked at it. Um, uh, we, we haven't necessarily found a great intersection between um, you know, the innovations in those specific neighborhoods. It's, it's a limiting factor. Um, I think um, a lot of opportunity zone investments have also been fairly real estate focused. Um, and you know, certainly they could, could include innovation investments, but it's, uh, uh, it's it's been tricky. Whenever I've I've, I've done a little research on it, um, and I'd say it's it hasn't looked like a, a natural uh, opportunity for us. But but I, I do think that there's there's potential opportunities there. Thank you. I, I think a lot about um, aging in place initiatives where there are now senior housing focuses of helping uh, regulate energy consumption um, to keep stable bills um, for those you know seventy plus in certain cities and communities. So that was the only kind of thing I, I was thinking about in terms of that opportunity zone um, as, as cities are trying to ensure that um, older generations don't, don't lose their homes, but while they are in their homes, there are some critical improvements that help to weatherproof or reduce energy consumption. So i um, not sure if that's helpful, Tom, um, as, as, you're, as you're asking those questions. So one of our final questions here is from Todd Adams, who says, great discussion and good to see you, David. So shout out to Todd. Um, <laughs> and Todd, adds, Todd says that public utilities often have monopolies and they are not committed to innovation despite their commitments to clean energy. So now how do we establish collaboration with utilities, communities, startups, and VCs to make this change? Um, if anyone has ideas there, feel free to hop in. Thank you, Todd, for the question. I'll, uh, I'll comment, you know, to say that, you know, with, with, with any partner, you need to understand what their parameters are, or what their motivations are, um, and what they're, you know, what they're limited by, and utilities are tough partners because they're a regulated industry. Uh, they're rewarded not for taking risks, but for you know the light always tur always turning on when you flip the switch, right? And they, they're extremely risk averse um, as, a, as, a, as a general rule. Um, and innovation can run counter to that. At the same time, they've got a strong interest in you know bringing on new customers. Uh, Electric vehicles are a great example of, you know, if we electrify uh, transportation, that's a huge demand uh, of new, uh, new customers and, and new need for their product. Um, and so figuring out where, where to engage with them, uh, you know, one of the ways that, that uh, startups will often try to engage with utilities, which is a, a great way and a tough way, is around piloting new technologies in a very small, uh, you know, kind of small scale. And it's a great opportunity because it's a potentially huge customer and a long-term opportunity for the startup. It's difficult though because uh, utilities move slowly. It can take you know six months to a year or two years to, to get the pilot set up, and then there's data collected, and then you know they have to make a decision after that. Um, a lot of these companies that are working with them have you know three months of cash, and we're talking about a two-year project, so it can be uh, it can be daunting. Um, but there are ways I would say to, to partner with utilities, and there's lots of good examples. Um, EPRI, uh, the Electric Power Research Institute, is a national organization of which most electric utilities are members. They have an innovation uh, program. Uh, it actually uh, manages a network of organizations like ours that work with clean energy entrepreneurs from all over the country. And, uh, and through that, there are opportunities for startups to engage with utilities and get exposure to utilities. Um, so there, there are ways to, uh, to partner with, with them in particular. This is the kind of thing, too, where it's possible that multi-state cooperation and collaboration could make a difference. So 
um, slightly different angle, but still in clean tech, but in the area of water um, instead of energy. Uh, officials from US EPA particularly frustrated that new technologies for water uh, usages have to be certified by each individual water and sewage reclamation district. Um, that's the kind of thing where if you can achieve a common standard that uh, the districts agree that, okay, if Chicago accepts this, then it's good enough for LA or for New York. And that's the kind of thing where you would think that state government could step in um, and assist in building that kind of uh, cross-state collaboration. Very helpful. Um, I also just toss into the chat um, the Urban X program, which also helps um, startups to get access to um, regulated industry and other kind of government procurement um, interest programs. Um, I'm only aware of them because Baruna Technologies is a company that we've reported on over at the plug um, who developed new water sensor technology to identify potential um, water quality issues. Um, so much more efficiently um, compared to what municipalities currently deal with today. Um, so I just wanted to toss that in there as a resource. So Todd, if you're still on, um, feel free to check that out as well. Um, just, so, just so you can kind of take a look and see which companies are starting to emerge from some of these programs. Um, I want to thank you all for this conversation. I've learned a great deal. I hope everyone here joining us for this session has as well. Again, um, Thank you to you, Jetta, Dan, David, um, for your work, um, also for helping us to better understand um, what is happening around us, that there is some hope on the horizon. Um, there are also some opportunities that we need to stay tapped into. So just as a final kind of departure, um, if you each briefly can just share the best way to stay connected to your work individually, um, and maybe just a tad bit of advice for us to continue to, to follow um, this conversation related to climate, tech, um, and economic development. If you have a suggestion for who we should be following, where we should be following, that would be, um, I think, beneficial to us all. Maybe we can start with you, Jetta. An uh, easiest way to get a hold of me is probably on LinkedIn. There aren't many Jetta Wongs out there, so it's not hard to find me. Uh, I would say my advice is keep an eye on your federal government. There's going to be a lot of money coming down from Department of Commerce, Department of Energy, um, and, and stay in touch with David and Virtue Lab because they're connected to this bigger network that's paying attention to these really important issues. I really think that community-driven partnerships and innovation is where it happens, and I think that that's what um, Virtue Lab has been doing. That's it. Uh, for me, I would say um, people should follow uh, the work that we're doing at SSTI.org, um, that's Sam Sam Tom Inc. or State Science and Technology Inc. Uh, .org, um, where we're reporting on a weekly basis on what's occurring at the federal level and trying to help people keep straight of all of the opportunities uh, that are headed their way. We hope. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Jetta and Dan. Um, uh, I will. I will add. You know, Virtue Lab is is you know is, is really focused um, on providing information and sharing with uh, information as we as we get it about opportunities with our community. Um, there are organizations like us around the org around the country. They're all slightly different, but that we do have peers. Um, so I'd really encourage you, if you're not in the Pacific Northwest, to find um, Jetta, I think, mentioned the Los Angeles Clean Tech Incubator. Um, there's Clean Energy Trust in Chicago. There's, there's organizations in, in a lot of different states that are really focused on uh, innovation and climate. Uh, and so I would, uh, I would point to some of those as well. Thank you all for joining me here today again. Um, Enjoy the rest of the conference, everyone. It's been a pleasure. Again, my name is Sherelle Dorsey, and you can also find me on LinkedIn. Thank you so much for having me, Virtue Lab.
Thank you, Sherelle. Thank you, Sherelle, and thank you, uh, Dan and Jetta and David, for an enlightening conversation. I, I can't wait till we're past COVID. I, I just want to get together in Miami or wherever and uh, get to say hello and learn in person. But uh, definitely points noted for me. Keep an eye. Jetta, thanks for the heads up. Keeping an eye on all that funding coming down. Uh, but also just remarkable to see what we can do as a community together to drive that forward. So thank you. Please uh, give a, a virtual round of applause to, to everyone and uh, a great way to kick off the, the morning, afternoon, or evening. We're going to uh, move forward now. So we uh, have a speed networking session uh, where you'll have a couple minutes to meet one another and get shuffled around. Don't feel bad if you don't get to meet everyone or, or if that time gets cut off. You can always go find them later. That uh, networking session is going to be in the agenda uh, for the link. And we're going to start in just a couple minutes. And for those that need a break and we're going to come back and join us, our next session will uh, start at 1140 a.m. Pacific. Thank you very much. Have a great networking session.